Um, one thing that's turned out to be actually really, really quite um, useful is expert colleagues who have access to the database and to the data sets in them. And we have one colleague in particular who just loves looking at data. So he would just you know, spend his evenings sometimes just snooping around a taxa he's in particular interested in and trying to see what the distribution ranges are and you know, what data has been entered. And he's come across um, really you know, mistakes. And so he's been, he's been really useful. So if you have people who are just interested in looking at things, they can be very useful as long as you have a feedback loop, obviously. Um, then the other, the last thing are the data aggregators. For example, Discover Life. I showed you a little map of Discover Life yesterday. And you remember it was a taxon. It had a lot of yellow dots all over the new world. And then there was one dot in Southeast Asia. If Discover Life finds distributions like that, it will send you an email and say, you double check that record because it's outside of the typical range of that particular taxon. So you might want to take a look at that. In this case, this is what happened. It's an invasive species, and that you know is reality. But in other cases, we found you know dots in the middle of the Atlantic or something, and they're obviously wrong. So we can go back and um, change them. Has mostly to do with georeferencing. So you did some made some errors in the way you georeferenced your data. Okay, um, labels are typically not imaged, difficult to go back to your original data. Well, what we're doing for our actual research projects, we're not doing that on a large scale at the moment, is for the very important specimens, and it could be type or specimens that were identified by an authority that we trust, and we're gonna be using that specimen as a reference for identifying taxa and things like that. We typically do take images of those labels on the site. So for our type specimen um, projects we did at, in London and in Paris and um, at the uh, USNM in uh, Washington DC, I, we always made sure that we took pictures of the labels along with pictures of the types. And in this case also it allowed us then to do retrospective data entry. So we didn't waste any time in the museums themselves just sitting there and databasing the specimens. We just took the images and ended the data entry back home. It was a better workflow in this case. Okay, specimen imaging treat a separate workflow. Um, so again, what we're doing for the ADBC databasing project, we're really not interested in capturing every last single specimen as an image, just because it would be a lot of work. What we're trying to do is get exemplar specimens imaged per species. It's not a perfect approach, obviously, because if you could take images of everything, it would be another check of you know, the taxonomy, for example. If something is misidentified, someone else could spot that out there and actually let you know. So this is not happening, obviously, but it helps you to you know, get an idea of what that particular species looks like. Um, the specimen damage part, well, there's really not a silver bullet for that, obviously. You really want to train your database as well. So we typically work with entomology undergrad students who have been through a couple of entomology classes. They've put together a collection. They generally know how to prepare specimens and how to handle them. Although we've always, we also had some biochemists, for example, doing a fantastic job. So it's a little difficult to predict sometimes. But generally, you want to you know, get people to appreciate that those are really delicate and very valuable specimens that already a lot of time and effort went into collecting them, preparing them, identifying them, so on and so forth. And generally, people understand. Um, for types, we are fairly restrictive. So we don't have them handled by untrained or you know, just semi-trained personnel, essentially. It would be typically the grad, either the grad students or myself really dealing with types just because we're not dealing with that many of them really. And then we have what we call a red cross drawer and that means if something goes wrong and it does, you know, a leg falls off, an antenna falls off or an entire specimen just breaks apart which is something that does happen if someone has put a big pin through a very small specimen that's something that, you know, that we see. We usually ask the undergrad students to transfer them into a separate drawer and then it's going to be one of the supervisors essentially taking care on repairing the specimen. So it does happen, although I would say it doesn't really quite happen as often as we would have expected. So people are generally doing a better job than, than we thought they did. 
Okay, so benefits of manual and you know that approach I was just telling you is essentially, and to me the biggest benefit really in many ways is that the full specimen data are directly available. So you sit there, you have to specimen, you enter it in a database, and it's out there through the internet and everyone can use that record straight away. So they can be mapped, they can be queried, and it can be downloaded and so on and so forth. The staging of the specimens, the specimen preparation, um, for example, I was mentioning um, sexing of specimens, keeping males and females separate, um, and things like that, or just organizing them by locality and stuff. It is obviously time consuming, but obviously there's also a real benefit for your collection because it helps you to really go through things and clean them up in a way that you can work effectively with the collection on the long run. It's a big problem for the huge collections. For the project we're doing, we think it's a good thing. Okay, then also another benefit is that each specimen will be physically associated with one of these unique specimen identifiers. And again, we think it's a good thing. And town was quite convincingly, I think, talking about specimen loans and how you track a specimen through your collection and through time. And this was really you know, tied to the concept of specimen identifiers. So we think this is very important. Okay, and then the last thing, when I started talking, I showed you a stack of labels sitting underneath a pin. Well, this is, I'm saying, stacks of labels, the information is stacks of labels are easy to capture. It. Well, it's still not easy, but you can capture them as part of the overall workflow without you know, too much problem. Okay, so this is what we're doing. And now look at that. So the so-called InvertNet, which is another one of these big advancing the digitization of biological co um, collections projects that are running at the moment, what they were saying they were going to do is provide digital access to 60 million specimens housed in 22 arthropod, primarily insect collections. So this is twice as much as the museum in London has. And you go, that means, okay, they were talking 23 years and 65 people, so this is going to be 46 years and how many people. And those are four-year projects. So you realize this is just, you know, either these people are just, you know, they don't know what they're saying, or they have a very good idea how to move that field into ways that you can use technology to incredibly speed up things. And I think they're on the right track in many ways, and I'm going to be showing some of the things they're doing, some of the challenges, and the way they're trying to solve some of these problems. I'm not saying, again, it's a silver bullet. It will work, hopefully, for their particular project really quite well. It wouldn't have worked for us because of the, the label issue, really. Okay, traditional specimen database approaches are way too slow, way too expensive. And then also another concern that um, the InvertNet people have been addressing is they don't feel comfortable with the level, a degree of specimen damage you're seeing overall. So they think if you don't have to handle the specimens, you can capture the information, that's the way to go. It's much better. Okay, so the basics of the semi-automated digitization are, um, this is a fairly recent development, so people started looking into that in like 2010 maybe, or a little bit before that, but not too much before that. The idea is really to capture images of whole drawers that you do not really excessively stage before you get going. Um, the key obviously are high resolution images. Either it could be one high resolution image of the entire drawer, and I'll show you examples of that in a second. Or you take multiple images, pretty much like the low key way I've been doing that with my little Nikon camera. And then you stitch these individual images together into a panoramic view, essentially. And then the idea would be, you don't do manual data entry of the actual specimen labels, but you would use methods like OCR, optical character recognition, and other approaches to actually get the actual data out there. This is something that is a lot more important for the botanical community. So Melissa is really going to be talking about that. I just have some remarks to make. And they're unfortunately not very positive. Um, and then the final thing is also in that whole drawer imaging, you wouldn't really physically attach a unique specimen identifier of any sort to each of the specimens. But you might still tie them to the individual 
images, essentially, to the occurrences. Okay, and the idea here is you would only do that if you, for some other reasons, would move or touch the specimens anyway. And it again ties back to the idea to reduce specimen breakage and, and damage. And it's, you know, obviously it's a, it's of high concern in entomological collections, but obviously other collections are fragile as well. Okay, in a way, a precursor to this idea of whole drawer data capture is uh, what's called GigaPen. Um, here's the URL that goes to, um, goes to this drawer in particular. And this was a project that was done by North Carolina State University, the Entomology um, Museum. So they were imaging 2,700 drawers with really relatively small cost and time. Stitched these images together, so they were taking individual, I can't remember how many shots they did, but it was quite a number. They took individual images of the drawers and then stitched them together and displayed them through the GigaPan web page. So GigaPan is an actual application that's out there and it's, supported, uh, it's a supported web page. So if you have to contribute, you can essentially just take your images and upload it to GigaPan. So their entire collection is visible through GigaPan. So that's a pretty cool thing. It's a pretty cool first step. You also see obviously one of the you know, big drawbacks we're gonna be getting to in a second you have specimens like that. The only thing you're going to be seeing is the specimen, right? Still of some value because someone can say, yeah, I know what that beetle is, I know what that lab is and things, and everyone knows what this one is, obviously. Um, it's a really famous um, Central, um, Central American beetle that's known for its extremely, and the male, extremely long legs. So that's, it's always a specimen we put into our show cases, insect, insect drawers, essentially. Um, in uh, some of these cases, you will actually be able to see the label and you can zoom into these GigaPan images online on their web page and you can actually read what's on the label. So that's uh, quite cool. One of the problems people weren't quite happy with is just because of the way these images are stitched together, you're going to be seeing some distortion. And they didn't really like that very much. I would say for most of the things we're doing, it might not actually really matter that much. But if you're really interested in looking at a morphology of a specimen or sometimes even read the labels, this can become a problem. So the solutions there are is kind of use a bit more upscale um, and more, you know, more dedicated systems of imaging really. So for example, the Natural History Museum in London has started using what's called set scan. So it's a fairly complicated big thing. It's a box, there's lights around it. The camera is up here. And this is where the camera is. And the camera would actually move over and across the drawer and take multiple images. So there's no tilting of the, of the camera around the insect drawer. It's just, it's a very flat thing. And then in the end, um, you will not actually, once those images are stitched together, you will not see any of the distortion you saw with the original GigaPan images. Okay, there's also something done by the Queensland Museum in Australia. They're using a Hasselblad, it's a really high resolution camera. Um, and actually, well, this information is from IDIG Bio. So it shows you the presentation where that guy from Queensland Museum actually talks about it. You can see the setup of that camera. And it's uh, the drawer is sitting on the floor essentially and the camera is up here and it's a very, very high resolution camera. You just take one shot and that's it. And then when you blow up, let's say the specimen over here, you can see that all the information is really clearly visible. You can also see, and I'm just going to be driving that, that point home over and over again, is that you only see really part of even just the top label. So that's obviously a problem. So if you know Australia well enough, you know this is probably Cape Tribulation, this is Mount Sora or something, but obviously some of the data are, are not visible like that. Okay, and this is exactly the point here. Specimen, um, the specimen itself covers the label data or multiple labels cover 